ಜಗತ್ಸಾಕ್ಷಿಪಂ ನಮೇಕ ನಿಧಾನ ನಿರಾಲಂಬಮೀಶಂ ಭೋಧಿಪೋತ ಶರಣ್ಯಂ ವ್ರಜಾ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಆನ್ ದಟ್ ಅಲೋನ್ ಡು ವಿ ಮೆಡಿಟೇಟ್ that alone do we worship to that alone the witness of the universe do we bow to that one who is our sole eternal support the self existent lord the raft to safety across the ocean of this world do we come for refuge om peace 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 Good morning. Wonderful to be here in Santa Barbara again in the midst of the mother worship season. Last week we had the special worship of Mother Divine Mother Durga and in a couple of weeks hence we'll have the worship of Mother in the form of Kali. So I thought we would take up a topic connected with Mother uh and I called it Seeking the Mother. I'd like to start with a little personal anecdote though usually we don't do that. Uh but I lived for 3 years in Providence, Rhode Island. 3 years I lived in Providence, Rhode Island. You may know that there's a Vedanta society there. And uh I I now know where that Vedanta society is and I know that I would have passed by that building dozens and dozens of times. But the time was not yet ripe i never went inside and never found out about it i never knew anything i passed by dozens of times but uh nothing happened till i came to california <laughs> so this t- this idea of the time being ripe is very appealing to me the time was not ripe for me yet and finally it became ripe and i think all of us can find in our lives a, a similar story that at a certain point of time uh our the, the our our the hour strikes as it were for us how many lifetimes it is said in our tradition how many lifetimes we've been uh, mucking around in the darkness how many years and years in this lifetime we've been struggling with all the petty things of life and then the day comes when we wake up we begin to seek we want to know we want something more we realize that we need something more than just our little ordinary life lives that just the little joys and sorrows of this world are not enough for us the things which used to please us no longer give us satisfaction and the happiness of our money of our nice car of our family of our house of our name and fame that happiness starts to tarnish and we realize this is this is not i'm not happy is there nothing more is there nothing more and then we begin to seek we begin to ask what is it beyond what i see what is there beyond this world we seek to penetrate the mystery of existence and to gain that which will give us true joy and true peace we become seekers of god so we should feel blessed that we have that we are seekers we should feel blessed because it is when we have become seekers of god that we shall find god it is very rare that someone stumbles upon god who is not seeking it it happens in rare occasions <laughs> but th- we can't count on that happening to us and we have the assurance from one of the world's great 
teachers. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened unto you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who seeks finds. And the door, every, for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. So let us rejoice that we have become seekers. Very, very few in this world are genuine seekers. Sri Krishna tells Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, he says, Manushyanam sahasreshu kaschinyatati siddhaye yatatamapi siddhanam kaschinmam beti tattvataha Among thousands of people, Arjuna, among thousands, perhaps one is a seeker. Perhaps one strives for perfection. And among those who are striving, those blessed ones who are striving, the seekers, one perhaps knows me in truth. So we are one in a million. One in a million. We, are, we are, have taken this momentous step. It's like a giant evolutionary leap, like that primeval fish crawling out of the swamp onto land. We are also striving to get out of the swamp and into the light of the spirit. So this is what we're doing. We're turning our gaze away from the endless round of births and deaths and uh, turning to face our true destiny, which is our spiritual destiny, which is uh, to know God, to know ourselves as we really are, as one with God. There are different classes of people in this world. I just thought to think about this for a moment. We have, of course, athe atheists, those who say there is no God, there, this is matter is all there is, There's, this is it, what you see and what you feel, what you hear, this is it. So eat, drink, and be merry if you can. It's not so easy to be merry in this world, but uh, that's actually not so many of the people in this country. It's a fairly small percentage of the people who are downright materialists. But a much larger uh, uh, category of people is agnostics. God may be there, God may be not there, I don't know. Uh, I'm not really, I don't really care too much one way or the other. Uh, uh, or, or else it's actually not possible to know if there's God or not, so I shouldn't, why should I bother my head about it? Or even if there is a God, he's certainly not doing a very good job, so I'm not going to think about him. Then we have classes of believers. The first class of believers, oh, God is there, no doubt, but I'm not, why should I think about God now? I'll worry about that when I'm on my deathbed. Now I have so many things to do, I have, I have my life to live, I'll worry about that later. Sri Ramakrishna used to say about those people, uh, they may say that they'll think about God at the hour of death, but their whole life they've been thinking about this world, and on, uh, when the hour of death arrives, they'll still be thinking about this world. Then there are those who look upon God as their servant. God should be uh, serving us. I approach God to fulfill my needs. I need a house, I need good health, I need a car, I need wealth, I need a spouse. This is probably... Uh, where most religious people fall into this category, uh, a shopkeeping religion. I pray to God and God should give me everything good. And it really it turns out that we, what we seek, we get. So if we seek uh, all those things, we, to a certain extent we get them. But then we don't get God. Then we don't get God. So then there's the category of seekers those who are striving to know, those who want to know why, not for any other reason, just to know. There's the deep longing that awakens inside. I want to know God, I want to love God, I want to know who I am. Not to gain wealth, not for name and fame, for health, for career, for nothing other than to know, other than to love. In this category, yearning has awakened within. Then there's a, a very small category, a final category, 
those who do know God, those who have realized God, those enlightened souls, those great saints who, have, uh, who know themselves to be one with God and still are among us for the sake of teaching us, for the sake of, sh of sharing the joy of spiritual life with us and bringing us all to that uh, fulfillment of our life. So let us place ourselves in the category of seekers. We are seekers of God. Going beyond conventional religion and entering the spiritual path, it is an active life. It is something that defines our whole life. When we are real seekers, everything is colored by that fundamental attitude of seeking. Uh, all our interactions with our people, the way we conduct ourselves at work, the way we uh, live with our families, Everything is touched by that inner longing, that inner thirst. And uh, Sri Ramakrishna used to emphasize this so much. He would say that this is the es one essential ingredient in spiritual life, longing, to want something. In fact, we find we don't do anything if we don't want to. If someone, uh, if someone wants to, uh, say a young person wants to study uh, engineering, but his father wants him to become a lawyer. He's, he's not going to take any joy in studying law. He's not going to be able to do it. He's going to press and beg and push, and somehow he's going to go and be an engineer. So similarly, when we want God, when we feel that yearning, that's when we start uh, making spiritual progress, when we start doing the kinds of things we need to do to know God. Sri Ramakrishna would say, one attains God when one feels yearning for him. An intense restlessness is needed. Through it, the whole mind goes to God. This intense restlessness, Sri Ramakrishna had a name for it, called it Vyakulata. It's the Bengali term. It means an extreme eagerness, a restlessness. I want, I can't think of anything else. Sri Ramakrishna used to give the example of someone who had lost a job and got so restless. Every day he would go out looking for a job and he'd go calling on the same people and they'd say, no, sorry, there's nothing today, no opening today. Next day he'd be there again knocking on the door saying, is there any opening today? That kind of restlessness. Or the restlessness of someone whose who's, uh, child has fallen sick and is very seriously sick, going to doctors, looking for the right medicine, a terrible restlessness. When that restlessness gets turned towards God, that's what defines the real seeker. And Sri Ramakrishna says, longing is like the rosy dawn. After the dawn, out comes the sun. Longing is followed by the vision of God. He has a wonderful story about, uh, about this restlessness, and it's told by Swami Vivekananda. So I'll read it in the language of Vivekananda. Vivekananda says, a great sage, meaning Sri Ramakrishna, a great sage once told me that not one in 20 millions in this world believed in God. Not one in 20 millions. I asked him why, and he told me, suppose there is a thief in this room, and he gets to know that there is a mass of gold in the next room, and only a very thin partition between the two rooms. What will be the condition of that thief? I answered, he will not be able to sleep at all. His brain will be actively thinking of some means of getting at that gold. And he will think of nothing else. Then he replied, Sri Ramakrishna replied, do you believe that a man could believe in God and not go mad to get him? If a man sincerely believes, if a person sincerely believes that there is that immense, infinite mine of bliss and that it can be reached, would not that person go mad in the struggle to reach it. It's a wonderful story, a wonderful, a so, such an apt a story. That is our condition. There is a mine of bliss right in our hearts. And that, the name of that mine of bliss is the divine, is the mother. The all blissful mother can be thought of as that mine of bliss. She is here. And yet, are we trying to reach her? Are we, are we spending sleepless nights struggling to reach her? No. So she remains an idea to us. God is still an idea to us. God is not real to us. We don't, that thief who knows that gold is in the next room is restless all night. How am I, I can break through the wall or I can 
get an, a saw and cut through. How am I going to get that gold? I'm going to get it. I've got to get it. That's the kind of restlessness we need for the mother. When, when we take the mother, when we take the divine to be the most real thing, then we strive. Then we become real seekers of the mother. Sri Ramakrishna gives another story about that. He says, you know, there's a, say there's a, a child and uh, his mother is busy cooking. And as long as the child is happily sucking on its pacifier and playing with its toys, the mother is perfectly uh, happy to let it uh, lie there and play. And she's busy cooking and uh, mm, doing, whatever she, doing her household duties. But there comes a time when the child gets tired of its toys, it throws away the pacifier and starts crying for its mother. Ma! What does mother do? Immediately, she takes the pot off from the fire. Of course, they were cooking in fire, on fire in those days. She takes the pot off the stove and runs to the baby, runs to the child, and takes, uh, takes her up in her arms. Immediately. So as long as we're happy with our toys, Divine Mother says, all right, my child, be happy with your toys. Be happy. I'm busy. But when we throw away our toys, when we say, I've had enough of all these toys, I don't want them anymore, I want you only, then the mother comes running and lifts us up into her arms. So, are we through with our toys yet? Are we through with our toys? So this yearning, when we, when we start feeling this yearning for God, this yearning for mother, we should recognize it as a great treasure and protect it, nurture it, stoke that yearning. It's like a fire. It may be just a small fire. We need to c carefully shield it from wind and let it grow into a blazing fire. That when it becomes a blazing fire, it will take us straight to the mother. There are several, uh, several things we can keep in mind in connection with keeping our yearning burning bright and stoking it. Uh, several uh, practices. And uh, one of them is the practice of discernment. We call it viveka, the practice of discernment. We just think about everything we see. And we, f we understand that everything here actually is impermanent. Every th this, w this world, it's a mixture of pleasure and pain. Pleasure following pain, following pleasure, following pain, in an endless cycle. But there's, there's no real peace here. We don't find the genuine, deep, everlasting peace. And then there is the inescapable fact, the one certain thing in our lives of death. Reflecting on that is called viveka, discernment. Reflecting on the inevitability of death for everything that we see, from the ant to the tree to ourselves to even the moon and the stars. Everything which had a beginning will have an end. When this truth really hits home for us, uh, a great longing arises, a dispassion, a, a detachment from from all the messes of our lives starts to arise and we start to get that longing for God. Another thing that we can do to protect and nurture this longing is to take up contemplative disciplines like a prayer, like repeating a mantra, japa, like meditation. Gradually, we begin to get a taste for these practices. We begin to get a taste for God. We begin to get a taste for the sweetness of uh, thinking of God, for the sweetness of divine communion. And uh, when we begin to taste that sweetness, we start to feel like we don't want anything else. When you've had, uh, when you've had, um, I can't think of the, the brand of chocolate, that really good brand of chocolate, uh, what is it? Well, there's, there's many. Godiva, Godiva, <laughs> Godiva is one of them. You know, Hershey's chocolate is pretty good. But once you've had a Godiva, Hershey's no longer appeals so much. <laughs> so the, the joys of this world, they're not bad. But once we begin to taste the joy of communion with the divine, it, we lose our taste for those, those things. It's a much sweeter, 
much, uh, it's an ineffable joy which can't be described in words. And tasting that, with the, taste for the, uh, the, the, the taste for those old things becomes insipid. So another important discipline we, we take up to protect our longing is keeping the company of other spiritual seekers. Keeping holy company, it's called. Sri Ramakrishna used to say, at the beginning of spiritual life, we're like a little sapling. A tr- we've planted a little sapling of a tree. And what we have to do is put a big fence around it, a stout, fe- sturdy fence, so that the wandering cows and goats that we see all around everywhere, uh, at least in the v- Indian villages, uh, don't eat the sapling. A sapling can be easily eaten up by a, a goat or a cow or um, a, a deer. I guess deer is the appropriate term here. And uh, we need to keep it protected. When that tree grows up into a tree, you can tie an elephant to it and it won't be hurt. But right now, it's tender, it needs protection. So we protect it and we keep the company of fellow seekers. There's a great, uh, the the wind of the world is blowing so strongly in one direction. And uh, the company of other seekers is a a great uh, shield for that. Uh, so we get a little bit of, of, of the holy wind. And of course, the company of great saints, if we can find a great saint, uh, a c- it rubs off, you know? Spirituality, the, the spiritual mood, it rubs off. If we can get the company of a great saint, even for a little while, our lives can be transformed. I know many people whose lives were transformed by a sh- just a few minutes in the company of a great saint. So let's talk a little bit about mother. Though it's not always easy to talk about mother. One of Sri Ramakrishna's great contributions to uh, the world is rejuvenating the tradition of approaching God as mother. The beauty of the Vedantic tradition is that we can approach the divine in so many different ways. We can approach the divine as father, as mother, as the soul of our souls. Uh, And we can call on God as Allah, as Jesus, as God, as Hashem, as and as mother. The closest relation we see in this world between people is uh, that between a mother and her child. The child has come out of the mother's own body. There exists such a deep connection between the mother and the child. And uh, the love the mother feels for the child is complete and overwhelming and all-embracing and all-forgiving and entirely uh, unconditional, at least at first. It expects nothing in return, nothing in return. It overflows from her deepest heart. And similar is the love of the divine. The divine love is all embracing, all forgiving, completely unconditional. In fact, it it is such because it stems from unity. It stems from non-duality. In essence, there is only the one, that one, Uh, when it manifests in this world of apparent duality, uh, it is uh, continually seeking to reunify, we can say in a kind of poetic language. And what is that love but that uh, force which is drawing back to unity, that force which draws us back to unity. Swami Vivekananda says, instead of our Father in heaven, we say, Mother, all the time. Swami Vivekananda was, you know, he was a great teacher of Vedanta, but in his personal life, he was utterly dedicated to the mother, to the Divine Mother, and he used to call her by the name Kali. So he says, that idea and that word are ever associated in the Hindu mind with infinite love. The mother's love being the nearest approach to God's love in this mortal world of ours. Sri Ramakrishna used to emphasize the closeness of the divine. God is your nearest and dearest. God is our very nearest and dearest and no one closer. And of course, in the highest divine realization, the distinction 
between myself and God disappears. It melts away. So Sri Ramakrishna says, God is your own mother, your very own mother. Is she a stepmother? No. Is it an artificial relationship? If you cannot force your demand on her, then on whom can you force it? God is your own mother. He used a charming language in Bengali. He would say, Tomar je apnar mago, your very own mother, my dear. She is your very own. So Sri Ramakrishna always uh, encouraged us to develop a relationship with God, develop a, a personal relationship with the personal God. And though he practiced all the different kinds of relationships we, we can have, he specially modeled for us and uh, emphasized the sweetness and uh, ease of practicing this attitude of a child and its mother. Sri Ramakrishna, we, we find that he was ever the blissful child of the all-blissful mother. If we read the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, the record of his and recordings of his uh, utterances and activities, we find on every page he's talking about mother. On every page he's praying to mother. He's singing to mother. He's dancing in joy, thinking of mother. He's uh, always, his mind is fixed on his mother. He knows beyond a doubt she who is his own mother, uh, his very own self who has become everything. Ananda Mai, the all blissful mother. Who is this mother then? Sri Ramakrishna knew her as a person, but, did, but, but how did he really understand her? What did he really understand her to be? In the uh, tradition of mother worship in India, uh, the divine, uh, the, con the conception of mother is the conception of God as power. God as the power which manifests this universe. And that power is conceived of as feminine. And this feminine power is the mother. It's a non-dual conception. We have Brahman, the infinite, the existence, knowledge, bliss, absolute. And we have the power of Brahman, Shakti, which is the mother, the divine mother. I think the, the, we can just quote Sri Ramakrishna a little bit to get a sense of how he understood mother. He says, the primordial power means this Shakti, this primordial power, which is that feminine power of the divine. The primordial power is ever at play. She is creating, preserving, and destroying in play, as it were. This power is called Kali. Kali is verily Brahman, and Brahman is verily Kali. It is one and the same reality. Sri Ramakrishna used to emphasize this idea of Leela, of divine play. How do we explain this universe? We can understand it in this light, that it's a, simply a play of the divine. The nitya and the lila, he used to say, are two aspects of the one, one and the same reality. The nitya, the infinite, the eternal, the unchanging, and the lila, that same reality in manifestation. He used to give the example of a snake. A snake at one time is lying still and unmoving. At another time, it's wriggling along. Now, can you say that the snake and its wriggling motion are two different things? No, you can't. The wriggling motion of the snake and the snake are one and the same uh, being. So likewise, the infinite reality, the infinite existence, consciousness, bliss, absolute, and its manifesting power are one and the same. So Swami Vivekananda used to say that uh, established in the idea of mother, we can do anything. You know, just as a child, thinks of its own mother as all-powerful. So the worshippers of the Divine Mother know that their mother is all-powerful. So they can do anything established in that power of mother. And he says, she quickly answers prayer. She quickly answers prayer. She can show herself to us in any form at any moment. And he says, worship her if you want love and wisdom. 
I'd like to recall for a moment Sri Ramakrishna's first experience of the mother. You, we know that uh, when he was uh, 18 years old, he came to Calcutta and started serving in uh, the temple complex at Dakshineshwar. His brother first uh, got the job, as it were, of worshipping the Divine Mother in the temple there. And uh, his brother soon died. So Sri Ramakrishna was asked to take up the position of the priest of the Kali temple, and he agreed to do it. The Kali meaning the Divine Mother of the Universe, conceived of as uh, the four-armed goddess. And uh, so he was worshipping her. And uh, very soon his mind began to wonder, Mother, are you real? I'm doing these rituals. Are you real? Do you really exist? Do you accept my offerings? Do you, are you real? And this uh, seeking began to overtake his mind in such, uh, to such an intense extent that day and night he was thinking about, Mother, are you real? I want to know you. I want to see you. His whole life became overtaken with this one thought of, I want to know Mother. I want to see the Mother. The ordinary priests, you know, they'll do their worship in the temple and then it's over and they'll go and relax not Sri Ramakrishna. He would extend the worship for hours and hours. And when it was finally time to close the temple doors at night, he would reluctantly go. And then where would he go? He would go off into the forest near the temple and sit there most of the night in meditation, praying to mother, meditating on mother. The uh, pitch of his uh, yearning reached such a fevered intensity that uh, finally there was a breakthrough. And I'll read what he himself said about this uh, incredible and Im uh, uh, crucial event in his life and in our lives. He said, I felt as if my heart were being squeezed like a wet towel. You know, when the <laughs> uh, in those days people would take a bath in the river and they'd dry off with a towel and then they'd rinse out the towel. It's not like our towels, it's like a a thin piece of cloth, and then they wring it out, twisting, 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 to get every last drop of water out of it so it'll dry quickly. So he said, my heart was feeling like that, like a towel being wrung out. I was overpowered with a great restlessness and a fear that it might not be my lot to realize the Divine Mother in this life. I could not bear the separation from her any longer. Life seemed to be not worth living. Suddenly, my glance fell on the sword that was kept in the mother's temple. I determined to put my, an end to my life. So feeling this intense misery at separation from mother, he grabbed the sword hanging on the wall of the temple with the intent of cutting his own throat. When I jumped up like a madman and seized it, suddenly, the Blessed Mother revealed herself. The buildings with their different parts, the temple and everything else vanished from my sight, leaving no trace whatsoever. And in their stead, I saw a limitless, infinite, effulgent ocean of consciousness. As far as the eye could see, the shining billows were madly rushing at me from all sides with a terrific noise to swallow me up. I was panting for breath. I was caught in the rush and collapsed, unconscious. What was happening in the outside world I did not know, but within me there was a steady flow of undiluted bliss, altogether new, and I had the direct, immediate experience of the Divine Mother. So we see how the Personal leads to the impersonal. Sri Ramakrishna was praying before Mother, intensely yearning for her. And finally, the Mother's grace uh, broke down the barriers to his perceiving her. And he entered into direct communion with Mother, not as uh, a goddess with four arms, but as an infinite ocean of bliss, an infinite ocean of consciousness. So this is the mother, an infinite ocean of consciousness 
who, which is dwelling in every heart and within everything we see. And uh, she is in essence infinite bliss. Though she dwells in the good and the bad, she manifests the seemingly good and the seemingly evil, yet she is beyond all of it, an ocean of infinite bliss. In uh, India at this time, of course, and here also, we just celebrated the Durga Puja, the worship of Divine Mother uh, in the name of Durga. And uh, it's a wonderful tradition which is celebrated all over Bengal, in every village, in every town, in every city, people come together to worship the Mother. And uh, the whole village will come together it's a great, uh, so, it's a great uh, power of uh, social cohesion also. It brings the whole village together in a worship. In the, in the larger towns and cities, neighborhoods will come together around different Durga Pujas in the different uh, neighborhoods. And in our main monastery in India, at Belur Mutt, we celebrate it in a really big way. It's a wonderful way, uh, thing to see how uh, it's... Uh, what, what we experience in this puja is a gradual and sustained, steady escalation of intensity. An escalation of intensity. It starts uh, more than a month before, on the birthday of Sri Krishna, when the image itself begins to be constructed. An image is built of, the, of a form of the Divine Mother out of clay. And for the, for the next month and a half or so, we see that image begin to take form. First they build an armature and then they add the clay and gradually the form of the mother begins to take shape. And uh, a big, uh, a big mm, tent is constructed and an altar is built and all this flurry of activity begins to get more and more intense. Uh, the, uh, those who have to see to all the details of the worship have to collect all kinds of ingredients, including waters from seven oceans and waters from the seven holy rivers and uh, earth from all kinds of holy places and earth from also unholy places. And all these things are going to be used to worship the Divine Mother. Then every eve for a whole month before the, the uh, puja starts, the monks gather together to sing songs wel welcoming the coming of the mother because the mother is going to come visit her, uh, her children's house. And it's connected also with the tra tradition in, of uh, the married daughter coming home to her parents' house. Uh, in India, at least in Bengal, the, uh, when a daughter gets married, she goes and lives with her husband's family. And she comes home once a year at puja time and here, the Divine Mother Durga, who is at once the all-powerful mother of the universe, is also conceived of as a daughter, as the daughter of the household, and she's coming back from her husband Shiva's house to uh, visit her uh, parents. So these songs of welcoming the mother uh, in increase in intensity as the day comes closer to the actual worship. So... Uh, then finally the day comes when the puja begins and the mother's presence is invoked in this clay image. And what was a simply uh, a statue made of clay, when we are there, we feel somehow that mother's presence has entered it and it becomes a living reality. We feel that mother is here with us and day and night worship is going on and the, uh, the w w one of the novice monks is... Uh, performing the actual ritual with dozens of uh, monks and novices around supporting the worship and chanting of mantras going on continually and singing of songs to mother and we feel the mother is here in our presence and uh, there are several very important uh, parts of this worship one is in which uh, the divine mother is worshipped in a young girl of about five years old and uh, I can't really describe it. You have to see it to understand. But uh, this huge affair where there are th there's thousands of people thronging the monastery and this giant image of Mother Durga and then this little girl, five years old, is placed on a throne and the crowd goes wild. And uh, 
she is dressed like a goddess. She's got all the decorations of, of jewelry and, and perfect dress. And uh, if they've chosen the right girl, then she's also, she's also uh, happy and she'll smile and wave. Not, not too much. She's a little bit serious, but she's not frightened. They've, and uh, even though uh, 10,000 pairs of eyes are fixed on her and the worship is done and one feels that it's truly the divine mother of the universe in this little girl accepting our worship. It's something to see and experience. And uh, uh, another uh, event is uh, the Sandhi Puja. In the junction between the eighth day and the ninth day, there's a short span of time. I think it's about 47 minutes or something like that, I forget. And the whole worship of the Divine Mother in the form of Kali has to be completed in 47 minutes. Now the worship is an extremely complicated ritual, so it has to be done extremely efficiently. And during this worship, there might be 10, there might be 10,000 people in the, in the tent, the makeshift hall outside watching this. And at that time, it's completely silent because everybody knows this is the auspicious moment when the demons were killed by the Divine Mother and all are raptly watching, praying, meditating. Here in Santa Barbara, as well as in Hollywood, we gathered also at that time to chant the Mother's name. Uh, so uh, it reaches this kind of fevered pitch of intensity that the Mother is amongst us, the Mother is real, the Mother is our own Mother, and she is amongst us. And then the inevitable time comes when the puja is drawing to a close. On the 10th day, we bid farewell to the mother and people will weep. People will weep when, it's, when the puja is over because we feel mother is going away. And what's done is the mother's image is immersed into the river or a nearby lake, as, it, as the case may be, but at our monastery in the river, which is flowing there, the Ganges. And uh, it's, a, it's a very meaningful uh, symbolic thing because the mother who had for these three days this form is going back into the formless. The form, the, the, the form has come out, arisen out of the formless and goes back to the formless. Uh, but before that happens, the mother's image is ceremonial, ceremonially immersed in our own hearts. And it's done symbolically like this. A bowl of water, a big bowl of water is placed before the mother's image. And in that bowl, an, a mirror is placed. And all the devotees who are present come and look in that bowl of water at the right angle at the mirror to see the mother's reflection in the water and feel that the mother is then entering their hearts. Uh, it's a wonderful um, it's a wonderful ritual. And so the, the mother is then, f we feel that the mother has come back into our hearts and so she's no longer in the image. So the image now is a, is a, a shell, we can say, uh, in which she had dwelt for some time and now she's no longer there. And then we immerse the image in the, the actual, actually in the river. Uh, and at this time, there's a touching sh song, which is a song which I'd like to share with you. Uh, it's a, a song praying, O oh Mother, just once, Mother, just once, reveal yourself to me in the lotus of my heart. Mother, I want to see that infinite beauty of yours, that beauty which bewitches this universe, which fills this universe to the brim. Mother, reveal yourself to me in my heart, in the lotus of my heart. Akbar viraj guma hridi kamola shone Akbar viraj guma hridi kamola shone Tomar bhuvan bhara rupti akbar dekhe loy manayane Tomar bhuvan bhara Rupti akbar dekhe loy manayane Kamola shane Here the heart is envisioned as a lotus which has opened. The lotus of course is, is uh, found everywhere in India and it's a uh, a symbol in 
Hinduism, a, a, a prominent symbol in so many different ways. And it's a wonderful symbol of the heart because a lotus, when it's closed, it looks, it's a lotus bud. It looks like something not very interesting. But inside is that all that beauty, all that uh, fragrance of the lotus and the beautiful co colored petals. They're all in there. So likewise, though, um, when we feel like our ordinary dull self, we, we may feel like a, just like an ugly lotus bud. But we know that the lotus is within us. That lotus will open. And when it opens, the fragrance of divine love comes up. So the lotus is a wonderful uh, simile for the heart. And on that opened lotus in our heart, that is a seat for the Divine Mother. And we pray as we know that the Mother, we're bidding farewell to the Mother in a sense because the, the three days of worship are over. The, the uh, Mother will go back to her own abode, as it were, and we are immersing her image in the river. And we say, Mother, be here in my hearts. Don't go away. You will be in, here in our hearts. Reveal yourself in our hearts. And there's another line. Uh, O oh, Mother, you who are the destroyer of misery. Mother, you who grant spiritual illumination. Mother, actually, I don't want anything. I don't want anything else in this world but your two blessed feet. I want your feet only, Mother. And I have this one desire that I will adorn your feet, your blessed feet, with the lotus of divine love. So my, let, my, let my love be like a lotus which I place at those two f blessed feet of yours. And uh, the, the last line of the song, uh, this is not the whole song, but uh, and it's sung by, uh, it's composed by a monk. So he, he says, this wandering beggar has one desire left, to see the divine face of the mother lit up with a smile. Then I shall sit on mother's lap, crying, Ma, Ma, and become absorbed in the deepest meditation. So uh, this uh, is the, the culmination of the three days is this final immersion ceremony when this, this uh, very touching and deeply meaningful song is sung where we, we are praying intensely, we're seeking that the mother whom we experienced as it were in puja for these three days is going to be dwelling within our hearts, is going to shine in our hearts. Though we're coming on the, towards the end of our hour, uh, I th beg your, your indulgence to let me share one more song with you. Uh, it's a song by one of the great poet saints of uh, Bengal named Kamala Kanta, who, uh, like his uh, counterpart, as it were, Ram Prasad, the two are the most well-known. There were, there were many others, uh, poet saints who were uh, votaries of the Divine Mother, illumined souls, who described their yearning and their illumination also in song. Uh, so in this song, Kamala Kanta likens his own mind to a bee, a bumblebee, a certain kind of a bee that <laughs> we all know what a bumblebee is. So a certain kind of bumblebee. And uh, he says, the black bee of my mind is drawn in sheer delight, is drowned and immersed in the lotus feet of the mother, in the lotus feet of Mother Kali. And uh, what a, a beautiful image. The, bee, the mind is like a bee, and it seek, all our minds, our minds are like bees. We're seeking nectar. We want enjoyment. We want nectar. And there's so many different flowers in this world. The flower of money, the flower of fame, the flower of sex, the flower of, flower of uh, chocolate, all these flowers are available to us. But, he says, all those flowers have lost their taste to me. They've all become disgusting. The, that bee only wants the, that nectar that is to be found in the lotus feet of the mother. Amajlo amara mon bhramora 
Kali Padanil Kamale Shama Padanil Kamale Kali Padanil Kamale Jato Bishoy Madhutu Chahalo Kamadi Kushum Shakale Charan Kalo Brahmar Kalo 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 Mishe Galo this is a, a wonderful line. After saying that the black bee of my mind has become immersed in the blue lotus flower of Mother Kali's feet, he says, Black is the bee. Black are the feet. Mother's feet are black, and black too is the bee. Black has become one with black. Black has become one with black, he says. The universe has dissolved into its root. The universe has disappeared, has dissolved into its root. This much of the mystery these mortal eyes behold, then hastily retreat. But Kamala Kanta's hopes are answered in the end. He swims in the sea of bliss, unmoved by joy or pain. All the joys and sorrows that we have in this world, they become, as it were, the same, because Kamala Kanta swims in the sea of bliss. The the Ananda Sagara, the sea of bliss, which is mother. When black becomes one with black, when the bee merges in the feet of mother, then uh, the tongue fails to explain what has happened. The, uh, the, uh, uh, the eyes beat a hasty retreat, but uh, somehow he manages through poetry to express the inexpressible. The seeker and the sought have become one. Pleasure and pain have become the same. And after so many days, after so much striving, after so many years of calling upon Mother, Kamala Kanta's hopes are answered in the end. All his desires are fulfilled when he knows the Mother. So, and attains the sea of bliss. So this is the promise of spiritual life that the black bee of our minds will merge in the black feet of the mother, that we will, when we seek the mother, we will find the mother. When we seek, we shall find. When we knock, it shall be opened unto us, and we shall swim on the sea of bliss. Thank you. I'll close with the chant. Om Sarva Mangala Mangalye Shive Sarvata Sadhike Sharanye Triambake Gauri Narayani Namostute Srishtisthiti Vinashanam Shakti Bhute Sanatani Gunashraye Gunamaye Narayani Namostute Sharanagata Dinarta Paritrana Parayani Sarvasyarti Hare Devi Narayani Namostute Om Shanti 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 O Thou the giver of all blessings, O Thou, the doer of all good, O Thou, the fulfiller of all desires, O Thou, the giver of refuge, our salutations to Thee, O Mother Divine. O Thou, Eternal Mother, Thou hast the power to create, to preserve, and to dissolve. Thou, the dwelling place, and embodiment of the three gunas. Our salutations to thee, O Mother Divine. O thou, the Savior of all who take refuge in thee, the lowly and the distressed, who takest away the suffering of all. Our salutations to thee, O Mother Divine. Om peace, peace.